Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me on this episode of Activist Lawyer. I am absolutely delighted today to be joined by a very special guest, Miss Mary Lawler, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders. Just by way of introduction, I'm going to go through this first. Um, Mary Lawler, who's from Dublin and is based in Dublin today, joins me from Dublin, has worked with human rights defenders for over 20 years and has been engaged in human rights work for double that time. Miri took up the mandate of Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights defenders on the 1st of May 2020 following a decision from the Human Rights Council. Miri is currently an adjunct professor of business and human rights in the Centre for Social Innovation, CSI, School of Business, Trinity College, Dublin. She is a member of the advisory board of both the School of Business of Trinity and the Centre for Ethics in Public Life, School of Philosophy, University College, Dublin. In 2001, Miri founded Frontline Defenders to concentrate on human rights defenders at risk. As Executive Director from 2001 to 2016, Miri represented Frontline Defenders and had a key role in its development. Miri was previously the Director of the Irish Section of Amnesty International from 1988 to 2000, after becoming a board member in 1975 and being elected Chair from 1983 to 1987. She has a BA in philosophy and postgraduate degrees in Montessori teaching and personnel management. Among her awards, many awards, is the Franco-German Award for Human Rights and the Rule of Law, and most recently the Irish Red Cross Lifetime of Achievement Award. Miri was also awarded honorary doctorates in law from University College Dublin and Trinity College Dublin. Thank you so much for giving up your time. I'm sure you're... <laughs> Time is quite limited at the moment. Thanks so no problem at all. And I'm, I'm just wondering, um, I guess I, I went through that and uh, there's much more to add, but just in your own words, if you could take our listeners maybe through, you know, your career, your impressive career to date and just up to the position that you hold at the moment or positions, um, that would be fantastic. Well, I suppose, uh, you know, when I left school, I, uh, I was wondering about whether I would do psychology and philosophy or law. And I went into solicitor's office and I didn't like, uh, though I don't think I got a good uh, understanding of it. I just was sent to get things stamped and like, things like that. So I decided to do psychology and philosophy, which I think is a wonderful grounding for any career. Mm-hmm. And then after that, um, I went to, uh, I took a year out uh, after my BA and I went to Canada and I sold encyclopedia very successfully. And it taught me, I always say, it taught me more than anything almost that I've done because um, it, 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 it taught me resilience. Uh, it taught me uh, uh, being able to just uh, learn how to persuade people better. And it also taught me to stand on my own two feet. So then I went back and I did Montessori teaching and um, then I taught as a Montessori teacher. And while I was teaching Montessori, I joined Amnesty International um, mainly as a result of my uh, my knowing uh, Sean McBride, the Nobel Peace Prize winner and American Medal of Justice and, and the Russian Len- the Lenin Peace Prize. Um, my sister had uh, been sent to interview him uh, for her journalism course and uh, over time another sister worked for him and he sort of adopted the whole family. So I got involved in Amnesty really as a result of his, of his, of seeing him. I remember picking him up at the airport one night, he was coming back from Russia and he asked me to come in and help him deal with his correspondence and I did and I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, he, he answered every letter from around the world that he had gotten. Mm. And uh, it was so impressive. I mean, the man at that stage was in his 70s and um, uh, we worked. I got him home, I think. I collected him at uh, around 11. I remember it being after midnight when I went into his house and we worked for solidly for a few hours. And he really cared about injustice, so I uh, so I joined Amnesty, and then I was on the board, and then after that, I was off the board, and uh, I became director, and then I left 
amnesty uh, to set up frontline defenders in 2001 and I did that until I retired in 2016 and then I got this uh, position which is independent of the UN it's independent of states and it's independent of NGOs Fantastic. And just going back a little bit there in time, in terms of finding frontline defenders, I mean, your work with Amnesty probably covered, well, it would have covered a huge amount of um, bases in terms of human rights in general and that type of work. But what drove you to really look at frontline defenders? You know, you founded that organisation and to this day you're continuing to work in that area. Yeah, I mean, you're quite right. And Amnesty International has a very broad mandate and uh, yeah, everything from extra judicial executions and death penalty to unfair trials to women's rights to everything, you, you, everything, torture, whatever. And it was a real learning experience for me because when I started, it was a very young organization in Ireland and we had less than 100 members. And uh, the board were all more or less um, older people who had been like I was the young one then they were all my age then and uh, so um, so I learned how to develop an organization and how to make it sustainable and how to professionalize it uh, because it was all voluntary when I started and when I left you know we had an office we had a, a director uh, we had we got money and we I'd done a lot of fundraising we had some money to keep uh, to go forward into the future but most of all we had increased the membership there were 15,000 members when I left from over from just 100 earlier yeah. so we had a good and I cleaned them all out I don't mean I cleaned <laughs> them all out anyone who wasn't actually doing anything yes. we just we, we didn't regard them as members. Sure. So that gave me a great springboard in a way to start Frontline. And I always felt that the people who build civil and just societies are the people at local level, the human rights defenders who work tirelessly against the injustice that they see at local level and, uh, and despite great personal risks. And I was very drawn to them in Amnesty International. And to be honest, Amnesty was only uh, beginning at that point to even recognize uh, human rights defenders and indeed um, trying to get human rights defenders to speak was very difficult, you know, when I say because the, the organization just didn't really know um, who they were and how to contact them and all of that. So I decided I wanted to set up an organization that would be fast, flexible and furious. That was the motto and would give 24 hour support uh, to human rights defenders at risk around the world on their terms and uh, learning from them what they would consider to be the most important. So that's why I did it. Excellent. Well, the next question, I suppose, I'm probably going to sound fairly basic here in terms of these questions, but just to explain exactly what is the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders and, you know, how do you carry out your work, I suppose? Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's quite limited in many ways, uh, the mandate. It, 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 the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders was adopted by consensus 25 years ago, 25th anniversary, mm. And uh, arising from that, uh, you know, and the declaration says that any person or organization who peacefully promotes and protects human rights and fundamental freedoms is is a human rights defender. And as we know, there are a lot of people all over the world who are doing this work, but they're not at risk. But the ones that I concentrate are the ones who are targeted specifically and precisely because of their human rights work. And what the mandate mandates you to do is, first of all, to write a report uh, every uh, year for the Human Rights Council and another one for the uh, General Assembly. And um, and so I've been writing reports on the priorities I set myself. So the first report was on the killings of human rights defenders, because we know that over 350 human rights defenders are killed every year for their peaceful work defending the rights of others. So I did that report first. Then I did a report on long-term imprisonment, which is another huge priority for me, because uh, we have seen in so many countries around the world, human rights defenders are targeted for long prison sentences. And often it's, it's 
align to a security issue in order to stop them and to prevent them from carrying out their human rights work. So I took 10 years as a baseline. And, you know, we wrote to uh, governments such as Turkey, Iran, UAE, Bahrain, China, Vietnam, and I've just finished a country visit to Tajikistan, and we're in the course of writing a a, a communication on the long term prisoners that are there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so that then I did a report on anti corruption human rights defenders because we see a lot of corruption in so many countries. Mm-hmm around the world, both in the political system, in the judiciary system, and in the businesses. And then business and human rights is another area mm-hmm. that I'm, I focus on because really it's because it intersects a lot with killings of, of human rights defenders and attacks against human rights defenders. Because it's already, you know, 70% of the killings, for example, are in the context of land, environment, and uh, indigenous people's really? rights. And then, of course, you have So the women human rights defenders and LGBTI defenders, people who are who are um, targeted not only for what they do, but for who they are, reprisals against human rights defenders who cooperate with the um, with the UN system and defenders with disabilities. Um, And this year I'm trying to target a bit more on young human rights defenders because it's the 25th anniversary and they'll be the ones that will uh, carry uh, us through to the next. Uh, uh, next uh, generation, uh, next 25 years. But to back to your question, so apart from the two reports mm-hmm. that I do every year, I do two country visits. As I said, I had an official visit to Tajikistan and I had an official visit to Greece to look at the situation of defenders, primarily the, the situation of defenders who are defending the rights of asylum seekers, refugees and migrants. And this year I'm going to Cameroon and Algeria on my two country missions. And my next report to the general, I just did this year, this year I decided for the Human Rights Council, I would do a report on the victories, the small victories and the big victories that human rights defenders have achieved in the last 25 years. So it was a nice report for one. But the one coming up to um, in October for the General Assembly will be on Women, Human Rights Defenders, Peace and Security. Okay. So then the way you carry out, you know, this, this, this is always on, you know, the report to uh, the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council, the two country visits, that's every year. Mm-hmm. But then in between, I'm constantly in touch with human rights defenders all around the world. Uh, I've spoken to over 1,200 human rights defenders since I started, oh you know, in small groups, twos yeah. or threes or whatever. And and then you write formal communications, formal letters to the government about the cases that you're taking up, asking for responses, and you follow up orally with them and uh, you meet them. So a huge amount of work there. And I suppose, um, yeah, I was interested there. That was one of my questions just in terms of the vulnerability of women um, human rights defenders in particular. Um, Just from a practical level, Mary, how do people reach out to you or how do you become aware of individual situations and particularly from those who are you know I I know there are a lot of human rights defenders at the moment you know we know they're in hiding in in places like Kabul etc how in practical terms do they avail of your support and assistance well I have a website srdefenders.org and on that anyone who wants to contact me can request a meeting so it comes in that way, it comes in through emails into the mandate inbox. But I actually, the year before the Taliban took over my first year, I had so many meetings with uh, human rights defenders from Afghanistan, uh, particularly women human rights defenders. There had been an increase in killings that year. And we were trying to do what we could to alert the international community uh, about the situation. It was deteriorating. Um, that year and then of course we had the awful takeover by the Taliban and I continue to have meetings with women human rights defenders all through that time and to be honest you know you feel so helpless but the most the all you can do is keep getting their voices out if you can and and we use you know the social media channels that we have we have online meetings for those who want to 
to, to have uh, have their voices heard, if they're public, if they want their voices heard, if if they if they don't want their voices uh, publicly recognised, you know, we 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 obviously don't give their names or or, or their cameras. Um, and we continue to hold online consultations with them about what's happening. We also have been working very hard, uh, you know, to try and get uh, humanitarian um, visas for women human rights defenders that we've met, because they all asked me yeah. to get them out. And uh, I wrote to all the countries that say in, they say they support the mandate of the Special Rapporteur and Human Rights Defenders, but very few responded. Mm. So Ireland took some in the beginning, which was great, yeah. and I uh, worked with them uh, on people that we had spoken to. Germany has been really fantastic for us. Um, uh, they have taken great. most of the people that we have asked them to take. Spain has taken a few as well. And this is a, this is a work in progress yeah. because obviously the situation is still really bad. We hear awful stories about women who might defenders. Absolutely. And I'm thinking in particular of the women judges, the Afghan women judges as well. And I know the legal community both in Ireland and the UK have, you know, um, rallied together to try and provide support to people who managed to escape or to avail of a visa. But as you said, the numbers are quite small. I know speaking from the UK's perspective, um, a lot more needs to be done there for them to get on board with that. Um, so that's really practical, you know, that you're able to, you know, source maybe a route or provide support and lobby member states and other countries to 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 help people actually physically leave that situation. Um, just as well, keeping on, on women, um, we've seen a lot in terms of the global response highlighting the need to protect particular groups who are, are under attack. And I'm thinking here of the women in Iran, which again is an incredibly live issue. So although people are highlighting, you know, these atrocities that face women, women, um, they're not all necessarily human rights defenders in the professional sense, but do you see this kind of widespread dissemination of information and campaigning via social media in particular as helpful in highlighting what's happening in areas like Iran or, or Palestine or Syria when, you know, people are coming under attack? Yeah. I mean, uh, just to get back to where you mentioned about the judges, not all judges either are human rights defenders. And I have to be very careful, you know, uh, about who I take up. And uh, because I've had a case, for example, of a judge in Afghanistan who definitely wasn't a human rights defender. But I take your point. (laughs) Some are. And, And but when it comes to Iran, of course, I mean, it is heartbreaking to see uh, what is happening to all those lovely young people in in Iran. And I think. You know, I, I like social media is a double-edged sword. It is so fast nowadays to get information out. Now, of course, there's the whole issue of dif- disinformation, but it can be an, an essential tool for advocacy and protection. And it can push states uh, into action, you know, and it can pu- push media, mainstream media, um, into into raising awareness, particularly in a country where um, media isn't free, and and I saw this when when I always remember when Facebook first came on. For example, I remember we were working uh, on a, a woman in uh, a woman lawyer, Justina Mokoko was her name in in Zimbabwe, and you know the normal route of trying to ring the lawyers, trying to get information, all time consuming, and them so busy trying to just do their work not wanting people to be annoying them, uh, was very difficult. And they set up a page for her and they posted everything that was happening at the time wow. on the page. So it was such a great way of keeping up to date. And it has developed since then. We know so much more about closed countries um, through social media because defenders have found ways around, um, you know, internet censorship and uh, uh, social media stuff. So I do think we learn um, much quicker. I mean, we would have been learning very slowly when I started. Yeah. Um, and 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 as I say, you know, despite the downsides, at least it gives the opportunity for awareness and also possible action. And and we have seen, like, you know, there's a special rapporteur on Iran, and there's a new. He called for a new independent fact-finding mission on Iran, which has been set up. So, I mean, it's, 
everything is, you know, very difficult and it's uh -huh. inch by inch. But at least, you know, there are possibilities uh -huh. uh, through uh, through social social media. And we see ourselves in our social media. We started to use it as an advocacy tool some years ago. And it's quite extraordinary. We've had tweets used in court cases. We, we've yeah. had the president of Honduras replying to a tweet we sent. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and that's what made me yeah. think that we should uh, use it as, a, as, as an advocacy tool. Yeah. Um, because the normal UN process is very um, precise and very slow to respond. Sure. Uh, because of the checks and balances that are in place and oftentimes, you know, the defender could be dead by the time sure. the UN would go through it, you know. Yeah, no, so. and it's very, I mean, it's very active and very live. Um, I've followed a lot of your um, social media activity recently and very informative for people um, who want to find out more about your work. But just there on that point again, um, you know, w w through the media, the general mainstream media, we're very familiar with, you know, what's been happening in Iran and some of the countries that we just mentioned there. But I'm thinking of other countries like Yemen and parts of Africa where people face really dire situations, you know, war, famine-like conditions that we don't really hear about as much. Um, but just are you conscious? And, and I mean, how do you actually, we, we mentioned social media there as a great tool perhaps for human rights defenders in particularly dire situations to reach out and communicate. But um, how do you reach people in those countries that are, you know, somewhat unreachable, I guess, yeah. you know? Yeah, and you know something? I think that COVID was a boon for that right. because, you know, I because you couldn't travel. And normally when you're traveling anyway, you usually go to the cities a lot mm -hmm. of the time and it's not to the remote areas. And one of my priorities is to try and meet human rights defenders working in very remote areas who aren't connected either nationally or internationally or even regionally as well, mm -hmm. or, or to the mandate. And so, for example, I had, I can remember having meetings with, with for example, I'll give you two examples. There was a group of Maasai women mm -hmm. and they were in a ballet in Ken Kenya and they were wearing all their beautiful, beautiful, I know I shouldn't say this, but they looked so beautiful with their with their attire. Uh, and uh, we had a meeting there about the risks that they were facing, not only from the government, but from the patriarchal society, which they were part of in the Maasai com community. And, and there was nothing around. It was a valley, yeah. you know. And then on the other hand, I remember, you know, having a meeting in, in uh, uh, it was in the Amazon. And you could see the trees really tall. Uh, behind you, and there was, it was like a little covering, you know, four poles and a bit of tarpaulin over, and there were some defenders there, and there were a few goats and children crawling around, and and you know, and one of them said to me afterwards, it was the first time ever he talked to somebody, and then this other woman said that what she has found is that uh, be, now with with so much happening online, she can search. For, uh, for possibilities to improve her way of working and to improve her knowledge uh, through the internet. So I, I just think COVID was great in that respect. Yeah. And like even this year, this week, I've had already had two hearings uh, uh, with uh, young defenders in this case, one from Palestine and one from Indonesia um, uh, this week. And uh, so we continue to put in place reaching out to human rights defenders, either those who contact us directly or through the networks that we have built up around the world in yeah. identifying uh, human rights defenders who are not from the city or not, you know, they can be, some of them obviously, but they can, they, they, they are deliberately chosen because they are working in very remote areas uh, and very difficult areas where, if, for example, in Brazil, you know, uh, the government, uh, the new government, hopefully, will be better than the last government. But they wouldn't even have any idea about what's happening up there. You know, yeah. and then when you talk about Africa, you know, Cameroon, a country I'm doing a country visit on. I mean, the French-speaking part of Africa, the part of Cameroon, is well documented by human rights defenders and NGOs. But there's a conflict. 
I mean, in the English speaking part of Cameroon. And very few people realize that. And there are defenders there, uh, like in Yemen, where defenders are doing tremendous work, yeah. you know, yeah. despite the despite the odds that they face, uh, the risks that they face. So brave and so resilient and um, fantastic stuff. You mentioned there a network that you work with and I'm just wondering how often, I'm sure you do engage with other organisations and I'm thinking of Amnesty in particular or other specific organisations that do campaign, you know, on behalf of individuals um, who are, you know, incarcerated or are in hiding for whatever reason. Does your work overlap or how do you manage to kind of um, work together towards the same aim? I made a decision at the beginning of my mandate that I wouldn't join any campaigns, any letters of any NGO because my background is as a human rights activist. And the one thing states hate more than anything else is somebody who comes from an an activist background because they assume automatically that the person will align with the NGO and will align with the human rights defender. So what I do is, I obviously, I take information from Amnesty, from Human Rights Watch, from FED Ash, from Frontline, from the Women's Coalition on Human Rights Defenders, from Eastern Horn of Africa Human Rights Defenders, from South Africa Human Rights Defenders, from Amina, from Euromed. You know, there are millions of organizations around the world, big and small, and at local le- levels. So, for example, in, in Guatemala, um, or in, well, I'll just say a different, uh, say that region, I am defensore. You know, I know my way around the world. I've been doing this work for so long, I know my way around the world. But I have to be impartial and I have to make sure that I check out the information that I receive before I do anything. That makes sense. And just you mentioned in um, at the beginning of our, our conversation um, the, the kind of interaction with human rights and business. And I suppose I'm really interested in that as well. And I mean, you being um, the adjunct professor with the, the CSI um, in Trinity as well, is that an area of work that's developing or is that relatively new, I suppose, in the world of human rights, that interaction between business, corporations, organisations that have that responsibility and human rights? I think that since the UN Guiding Principles, the Global Compact first, and then the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, there's been a very slow development. But it is, in my view, at the moment, picking up a bit. Because several states have brought in um, laws uh, which uh, 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 are laws to do with uh, business and human rights. Uh, For example, Germany... France has the vigilance law, Um, UK has a slavery, anti-slavery law. So you see bit by bit people bringing in laws where business, the adverse effects of business uh, uh, can be highlighted and challenged. I also think the new EU directive, draft it's a draft directive at the moment, but the new EU draft directive on um, Uh, Human rights and environmental due diligence uh, is very important uh, because it means that business has to take into account uh, if when they're doing their uh, uh, due diligence and risk analysis, uh, what the adverse effects on the community could be or the environment. And and that's huge. And we managed to get into that. We did an awful lot of lobbying on this directive. We really wanted human rights defenders to be named as stakeholders in the directive because very often they are the voices of the communities that are affected and very often, and they're targeted and killed often for that. But as well as that, they're also the ones who know the situation, who can help mitigate you know, uh, uh, or uh, um, uh, uh, an adverse solution, uh, an adverse uh, action, and who can suggest possibilities for coming to a solution. So they're really important in in the in the due diligence process. Now the OECD are also doing uh, guidelines at the moment, but that has to be by consensus. And unfortunately, Israel is blocking that at the moment. So we're hoping. Uh, we're, we just hope that we can get enough states to try and ensure that um, uh, they put pressure on Israel to stop 
blocking more of the human rights uh, the, uh, provisions of it. But you see, even last week I was in with an investor company here. They've taken on seven people in the last uh, two years to um, uh, to run their ethical investment Is this uh, unit. Yeah. Okay. Because they want to, uh, because the the people are now wanting to invest more ethically than in the past, and you see that, and also the Norwegian Pension Fund, which is huge, we went to see them in Norway, and they have put in in their human rights expectations to uh, the issue of human rights defenders. So you can see it's a slow burn and a slow boil, and of course you're up against the might of multinationals and the extractive industry and agri business and the clothes industry so it's 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 not going to be easy no. but at least i think there are signs that it's going in the right direction and the un is um is uh, trying to make progress on a binding treaty on business and human rights which would be another step forward it's going to take probably about a dozen years mm. but what is interesting for me is you know the EU were against it in the beginning but when i was in germany lately for example talking to the ministry i was asking the person responsible for this um you know what was their view on it and he said well he said we used to be cold but we're now lukewarm because how can we have our own law and be lukewarm and, and be cold about a, a treaty Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can see these kinds of different nuggets. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And lukewarm is certainly better than cold. Um, so fantastic. Just we read some all right, some of your awards there, but among um, your many accolades, which also includes, by the way, Irish Tatler Woman of the Year Special Recognition Award. Um, you were awarded, as we mentioned, the Franco-German Award for Human Rights and the Rule of Law, as well as later an honorary doctorate in law from um, UCD and I think somewhere else as well that we mentioned. But just... I suppose I'm, I'm thinking about rule, um, the rule of law and how important it is that us as lawyers, I'm a solicitor here, and, and activists continue to uphold the rule of law. And I'm thinking about countries that maybe you didn't mention there, but even westernised countries here. And I know this is maybe outside of, of your mandate in general, but I think we always take it that the rule of law, take it for granted that the rule of law is applied correctly. Um but how important is it that that concept or the framework that underpins a fair and just society um, is upheld? And, you know, it is frequently under threat, even in so-called westernised democracies. Um, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, when I was in Greece, I mean, you know, you look at the situation in Greece where lawyers who are trying to defend the rights of refugees, asylum seekers and migrants are being criminal criminalised mm -hmm. and charged with things like um, you know, aiding illegal entry, uh, aiding and abetting illegal entry, um, money laundering in some cases, or espionage. In you know, and this isn't just Greece. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is all around the world. So, and you know, every year when I present my report to the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, there's what they call an interactive dialogue mm -hmm. uh, between states and myself afterwards. And this year, you know, the the the, the states I consider to be more hostile, they get up and they say things like, you know, uh, everyone has to abide by the rule of law, and these people haven't abided by the rule of law. And uh, and I just said, look, I am tired of listening to people talk about the rule of law as if, you know, their laws were just and fair. Mm -hmm. I said, every we all want the rule of law. But if the rule of law isn't in accordance with the international standards to which you agreed, then it's not the rule of law. You can't be charging people, you know, under spurious, uh, with spurious offences that aren't grounded in uh, the standards that you've agreed to uphold. So I think it's really important, you know, and I think we need to keep calling out this thing like, you know, where they say, uh, you know, they're breaking the law or they didn't abide by the law or whatever. And, uh, you know, because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a convenient excuse yeah. uh, for states if they're trying to detract attention. And as you say, you know, you see it yeah. in Western countries all over. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a slippery slope. We're not being criminalised here, but you'll see lawyers, especially those helping migrants, um, asylum lawyers, anybody working in immigration activists are being pretty much hounded by media and, you know, even the government who will, you know, out them as activists, lawyers, lefty lawyers that are kind of slowing up the system. And it's so dangerous and it's so, um, Mm. such a a breach and such a threat uh, to the rule of law. And it just continues, you know, and although, as I said, there's no criminality uh, involved, it really, really leaves the door open to actual genuine threats and attacks on lawyers doing yeah. their everyday job, which is quite worrying. Yeah. Um, but just moving on, in terms of Mary, like I mean, the work and, and the mandate there is extensive, and um, you know, I urge anybody to have a look at, at your website as well, just to, which covers the particular cases, and you've published all of the reports as well. And you know, a lot of the information I've seen comes from tweeting and your social media around. I think the most recent articles were around Saudi Arabia, and also something recently. On, on Philippines and particular cases that you're working on there. But just with this podcast and with our forum, we have so many questions from students and law graduates in particular who contact us about getting involved in human rights work and not necessarily as solicitors or lawyers, but perhaps they want to do a law degree or are contemplating that. But many of them feel that, you know, they have a legal qualification but are put off by the arduous road around qualifying, etc. What other routes um, might be available for people who want to work in human rights and maybe follow, you know, in your footsteps perhaps and get to, get to that level? What tips or advice might you have for them? Well, to be honest, um, you know, I probably wouldn't have got a job in Amnesty now mm-hmm. as I did then. I think it is much harder now. Because everyone nowadays not only has a, a primary law degree, uh, they have a master. Yeah. They speak a couple of languages. You know, uh, so it is more difficult to get into the human rights field. And there are more and more people involved in NGOs around the world than ever before, okay. uh, which is good. Yeah. And uh, But it means that somebody starting out, it is difficult. So um, the advice I normally give is, uh, first of all, you know, get some sort of relevant degree. It doesn't have to be law. It can be, um, you know, uh, a, a language, and uh, it can be um, a, uh, a a part of the world. You know, specialising on a part of the world, anything like that. Yeah. And then after that, you know, you really do need to uh, build up some field experience. You know, you need to go on. Uh, on to a country and work um, there, uh, which I know is harder said than done. Yeah. As a volunteer, which you need obviously to uh, get enough money together sure. to support yourself while you volunteer, but it is the best way of building up a CV. Um, I can speak for my own daughter here now. Uh, it's in, it's not really comparable because I was able to help her and a few others, you know, get volunteer jobs, but. When she when she finished her primary degree, she wanted to do a master's in human rights, but she said she didn't want to go straight into it. She wanted to go somewhere for a year and really, really have a look at uh, how how in practice yeah. human rights were were implemented or not. Uh, so the first person I met after she asked me this, I was going to Geneva. I was in Frontline at the time, and I met a friend of mine, mine at Kiai who was the uh, commissioner in charge of the national institution in uh, in Kenya. And I asked him to take Marissa. And she went there for a year. She got more value out of that because she worked with different commissioners, the commissioner for prisons, the commissioner in charge of women, the commissioner in charge of uh, public research. And, you know, the, um, so it, it was a very good brand. And then she came back and she did her... Her, um, her her masters. So, I mean, I don't think you'd need to stay a year. And I certainly don't think you should do internship after internship after internship because mm. you'll never get it. Yeah. But you do need to have some idea of the aspects of human rights that you're interested mm. in. That would be the first thing. And then you need to think about what it is you need to get a job in that aspect. Uh, if it's a specific aspect, like refugees, for example. Sure. And and then you need to think about languages and where you would go to get practical experience. If it's more general, 
uh, you know, there are many routes. It's not just law. It's not just human rights. It's not just, it could be international relations. It could be, you know, Middle East studies or African studies or something like that. So it's really, you have to think about what it is that you want, how how you want to uh, develop and, and get into it. But mainly I would say once you know what it is, which bit of it you like or you'd like to pursue as a career, you put in place whatever um, whatever uh, uh, degree you need for that. Yeah. You you really should have another language nowadays. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, everyone is, so has important. language. Yeah, so nowadays. competitive, yeah. So, you know, uh, and go uh, go to a country and get some um, some experience. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant tips. And just finally, I suppose the people that you're working with are, you know, it goes without saying, incredibly brave, incredibly resilient. And, um, you know, you're in touch with them frequently, probably daily. Um, But just, I suppose, in a broad sense, given that we're in 2023 now, you know, we're witnessing horrendous um, atrocities around the world, um, you know, close to home here, Ukraine, um, being one example. But how important, Mary, is activism now and how important is it that people rally behind human rights defenders, lawyers, anybody who fits the definition? Yeah, I mean, I started in the 70s and in the 70s you had a bunch of military dictatorships in Latin America. They were dropping people out of planes into the sea in Argentina. They were macheting uh, little children to death in Guatemala, uh, you know, in the conflict there. Um, so, and there were all these thugs in Africa as well, dictators. And you had the Soviet Union. And, of course, um, you know, you had uh, started, uh, the, you had the troubles in, I always think that's the terrible, in there. you had the conflict in Northern Ireland. But, um, so... I, I suppose I think that countries go up and down, yeah. you know, and uh, abuses go up and down. And uh, I, I take the view that the poor and the marginalized, and uh, they are the people who will always find it difficult to have their voices and their rights upheld, their voices heard and their rights upheld. And you need human rights defenders to help in that process. So I think it's extremely important because no matter how little human rights defenders accomplish, and oftentimes it seems like you're just pushing a stone up the hill, the world would be a far worse place now without the work of human rights defenders. And everyone can be a human rights defender. Everybody can do something that will improve the lot of somebody else. It's, it's, it's not hard. Um, but for for me, I think you know making a career in activism and being committed to it is is something that um, teaches you the value of uh, how actions can actually change things. Yeah. I I think that's what it is about about uh, for me about human rights work. I've seen enough change come about because of the work of human rights defenders around the world. Small victories and big victories. And for me, you know, knowing that you can be a part of change, a part of action, is as good as it gets. And I think we should just all build it into our days, you know, day in, day out. And especially for the children. I mean, Mm -hmm. especially for the children of this world. I mean, that, in one way, you know, was one of my prime motivations, that my children would grow up in a, in a fair and just society mm-hmm. Mary thank you so much for sharing your work and you know your advice and your, your tips there for people who are interested in getting involved in it it's been so inspirational and um, insightful so thank you so much for joining me here today thank you Thanks everyone for joining me today. If you like the show, please remember to share and leave a review if you have a moment. And you can also check out our website, activistlawyer.com, where you will see some blog articles written by our guests and contributors, as well as some fabulous Activist Lawyer merchandise. This podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio. Interested in starting up your own podcast, but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. 
We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.